them wasn't just for good girls, but for people like me, mad as mad can be, and looking for happiness, but in all the wrong places. Rabina has been a Buddhist nun in the Tibetan tradition for over 40 years, and throughout the years, she has worked tirelessly in service of her teachers and their vision. Rabina was the executive director for the Liberation Prison Project, teaching meditation and Buddhism in high security prisons to men on death row. Her life and work with prisoners has been the subject of the documentary Chasing Buddha, which premiered and was honored at the Sundance Film Festival. A few weeks ago, one of our beloved ex-students, Natalie Templeton, took her own life. When Natalie's mother, Brenda, rang me to tell me the heartbreaking news, I contacted Rabina. Brenda encourages us to talk openly and honestly about mental illness and the suffering we experience. Mm -hmm. As a 63-year-old woman, I am in the extraordinary position of meeting and working with young people every day of my life. I regard it as a responsibility to do what I can to inspire them to believe in what is possible, which is why I asked Rabina to join us. I can think of nobody better than Rabina to bring compassion to the dialogue about why we suffer and the wisdom about who and what we have the capacity to be. Thanks, Rabina, for being with us and Thank welcome you so to much. you all. Thank you, Kim, and thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, and hello. And I, yeah. Well, what to say, you know? I mean, um, I think if we look, I think if we look, I think if we look around, you know, I think if we just look around, we're gonna see every, everywhere we turn, everywhere we turn, we're all different, but in one way, we are absolutely and utterly the same. I mean, this happens to be the Buddhist view, but never mind that, you know. It's just something so human that somehow, I mean, the Buddhist view would be, let's say, we have, all, we have different qualities in the mind. They've got this very particular view about the mind. The mind doesn't just mean the, the, what's ticking off in our brain, you know, but it's a word that they use sort of synonymously with the word consciousness to refer to the entire spectrum of our inner being. And it's, it, we all, we've all got this big soup of everything in there, haven't we? We can all recognize the words attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, low self-esteem, arrogance. We can all recognize the words love, empathy, compassion, kindness. And we can see, we've got, we, we can all recognize these. And somehow, I mean, this Buddhist psychological model, it sounds awfully very simple. I mean, we're very, we've got these very complex concepts in the West, you know. But this seems to be so simple, and it's words that we would understand automatically. Well, the, the, it happens to be the interesting point about the Buddhist one. And this is not just coming from the sky. Buddha's not a creator. I have no objection to that, but he's not a creator. He's this person who came out of this amazing system in India where they really worked on their mind in the most astonishing ways. I mean, recently it was the Dalai Lama who said it was these amazing Indians, more than 3,000 years ago, actually, who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. I think sometimes in us kind of arrogant Westerners, we think we probably started with Mr. Freud 100 years ago, you know? So there's just only now recently there's more and more kind of awareness of this incredible system that used to be, that is in India, this view about the human mind this and and where they got these ideas from is not by, not with a microscope you know this is the the incredible difference with this approach not with a microscope you can be a neuroscientist i have no complaint about that but this approach is intensely personal and intensely subjective this this approach that that, that you know that um that they are the ones three thousand years ago who invented this that what the world knows vaguely is mindfulness this is coming from these indians more than three thousand years ago you know and Buddha, this person who went through that system, and then he diverged in his own direction, in particular in relation to his own experiential kind of experience, experiential knowledge about the mind, about the potential of humans. So one of the key things that Buddhism says, and I mean, it doesn't matter if Buddhism says it, but I'm giving it its appropriate source, is that we've got all of this stuff. We have this massive soup of emotion, but somehow the unhappy neurotic ones, we've all got them. You know, they, they loom very large in our heads, don't they? I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've never, met, never met yet a person who says, Rabina, I can't stop thinking good thoughts, you know? It's always the, it seems to be always the unhappy ones. But the, the, but the key point is, and I, I mean, this is what I'm trying to prove to be true, don't just swallow this whole, is that the, those unhappy ones, low self-esteem, despair, depression, anxiety, jealousy, anger, they are there, they ru sometimes run the show, but the key point about them is, and we need to find this out for ourselves, is that they're not integral to our being. They don't finally define us. They are there, they cause pain. I mean, look at the world, you know. But they don't define us, which implies that, you know, we can, we can learn to work with them. They're not set in stone. I mean, this is the key job. And I don't like to talk about it as some kind of religious belief. It's not. It's this practical, practical psychology. And that the other qualities, 
you know, the optimistic ones, the positive ones. I mean, just do your own research in one day. Check the last time how you felt when you were feeling optimistic, kind, empathetic. You were more spacious, you know. You were more spacious and more connected. Check the last time you were feeling anxious, despairing, jealous, like a nightmare, kind of locked inside ourselves. So these things are here, but we can. But it's it's infinitely flexible, you know. One of my, one of my teachers says we can mould our mind into any shape we like. And my sense is that no matter how crummy we are, no matter how bad the depression is, no matter how bad the anger is, no matter how bad things are out there that seem to be triggering it, if we can kind of sustain this confidence, not a belief in a blind sense, but a confidence from knowing our own minds, from getting sort of u- almost using logic to understand, yes, that stuff is there, not to be afraid of it. I mean, part of the approach in learning to, 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 to work with your mind using these practical psychological skills called meditation, and I don't like to mystify them because we do mystify them, we shouldn't. They're practical psychological skills. One of them is this, sim- this mindfulness business is really a technique to help you simply learn to concentrate. I mean, whether you want to make a cake or whatever, or know your mind, you need to concentrate. It's pretty clear. And then you can learn to observe. So, uh, so I think part of our problem, because the, the, the unhappy emotions are so painful, Depending on our personality, many of us literally live in denial of them. We try to push them away. I mean, no, one, no wonder we get what they call in the West, you know, P, what is it, PTSD, because we live in, de- we try to push everything away. We can't bear the pain. And that means we can't bear to look at it. So if we can have the courage to know, first of all, this is the thing that sustains me, to somehow know, no matter how, ba- it's, you know, how bad things get, the unhappy states of mind don't define us. They're there, they're real. And the other thing we can start to understand, this is the Buddhist approach, but it's so practical. If we can start to listen, when we you know, listen, not just feel the pain physically, not just peel, feel what we think physically. Part of our problem, I think, is we, we are a little bit kind of obsessed with our physical feelings and we don't even notice what's happening in our mind until our body feels it. And often that's too late. One day you wake up and you're inert in bed and can't get up because you're so depressed. But it's been happening for a long time because nothing goes astray. Our mind is constantly working, constantly working, constantly working. We know this, but we don't pay attention until it's too late. Or or the other side of it is like you don't realize you're angry until you want to kill your boyfriend. And this is, I think, one of our major things, our tragic approaches in our in our in our approaches to the mind in the modern world you know if you go to your therapist and say i got annoyed today they'll tell you to shut up and go home you know they're not interested in sort of they they want the damage they want they want the kind of the serious ones when you want to kill your boyfriend then yes come to the therapist but no this is completely mistaken if part of our life part of our ordinary daily regime of living and this is do not hear it as religion you know Nothing to do with religion, it's practical. Could be simply even starting the day, you know, some, and it needs discipline, and that's our part of our problem, we're not disciplined. But if we could just bring into our lives this kind of, some kind of simple thing to start the day, it's not magic, it's just training, it's training ourselves to, to learn even a few minutes every day, some kind of technique where we can learn just to sort of sit, whether it's on a chair or I don't care, on your head, I don't care, and learn to just kind of give it a break for five minutes, you know. There's so many kinds of meditations. We know we can't make all the thoughts go away. Okay, in the long term, in the Buddhist view, we've got these incredible skills that enable us to really absolutely unpack and unravel the contents of this mind of ours and to have incredible control. That's definitely the possibility. That is the potential. Most of us might not accomplish that, but that, is, that potential is there. But the key one is to have the courage to not be afraid of whatever goes on in our minds. And then the other one is, and this is the, the major one, not to define ourselves not to define ourselves by the depression, by the anxiety, by the jealousy. Not to define ourselves, I'm a jealous person, we say. I am an angry person. And, we, and then we set it in stone. And we, in other words, we make it bigger than it is. We over-exaggerate. This is a tragedy. So when we over-exaggerate those states of mind, they freak us out. So we either live in denial or we, or we, or we, just, we swim in them, you know. So de- all this demands courage. But we're very good at this. We're very good at doing anything we decide to do. We're brilliant. We're good at techniques. So it's just this attitude towards the mind. It's it's more like an attitude towards your own mind, that everything is in there, yes. But these unhappy things, they are there, they're real, they play a role. And we, but we can learn to work with them, we can learn to harness them, knowing they don't define us and having the courage to know that they're not set in stone. Having this attitude, then we, with anything, we can then, you know, learn to be so brave. And then, of course, we can help others. I mean, there's this lovely analogy that I always quote that, that Buddhism has. A bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. 
Well, the wisdom wing is like all the nuts and bolts of working on your own self, knowing your own mind intimately, being brave about what's there, learning to define yourself in terms of the optimistic, positive qualities. And this is not trying to like be Pollyanna or anything. It's really trying to see more deeply how this is so, you know, how, how, the, how, how the unhappy ones sort of exaggerate. We see this. We make mountains out of molehills. Our mothers would tell us that. And then to have this um, approach that my mind is my own, it's my mind, yes, the outside world plays a massive role. And this is a crucial point, actually. Something that I think our neuroscientific views and our, our psychological views absolutely put all the emphasis on the external conditions. What happened before? What happened when you go to your therapist, you looked in the past, looking like a needle in a haystack, looking for a needle in a haystack for what it is that happened that caused you to be depressed, that caused you to be angry. Maybe we can do this, but maybe we don't need to. This approach here is more, who cares whatever happened? It's okay. It's all part of your life. Join the universe. We all have mums and dads and crazy things happen. The real skill we need to learn to do is be conscious of what's happening in here and not always feel like it's linked only to the outside. Learning to know what happened on the outside is good, but the real one to learn about is what's happening in the inside, you know? And knowing is infinitely flexible. It, it, I can change, I do have potential, my, my positive qualities do define me. I can, and they're not set in stone. None of it is set in stone, you know? And it's not just some random. I mean, we're very good in our culture at really excellent techniques to do anything. Make a cake, build a building, we're geniuses at this. But this is interesting, this, this, this skill coming from these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago, coming then, of course, through Buddhism, I know Buddhism mostly, you know, is this, 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 we can, the same skill and clarity and precision we know we need to even make a good cake. We need to use that level of skill and, and, and clarity and analysis to unpack and unravel and reconfigure this mind of ours, you know. We're not discussing the brain. You can be a neuroscientist, fine. We're not discussing that. We're learning, as one of my teachers says, we learn to be our own therapist. Of course it's a difficult job. It's one of the most difficult jobs there is, but it's the fundamentally necessary one. Then whatever you learn to do, become a multimillionaire or have, be a mother and have 10 babies, either way you'll do it well, because you're in charge of this one, you know. And often I think we do not believe we're in charge of this one. We really are such victims of circumstances sometimes that we feel like we have no choice. And this is why for me, you know, I'm sure when I was there last time we talked about this, working with prisoners for many years, especially in the States where it's just so insane, I can't tell you. And there's this one woman I always use as an example who was accused of, he was some hippie in the 70s with a couple of kids hitching in Florida with a husband. They get picked up by two guys and the police stop the two guys and the, and the guys kill the police but blame the hippie. So they're on death row, you know. I mean, she's, out, she's a little old lady in Ireland now helping other people out of prison. So it's basically this, in, this like nightmare for 17 years, this hell on earth. Her, you know, her husband even was executed. She went to the execution. She's in prison too. And his head burst into flames. She lost her children. Her parents died. You can't imagine one, you know, one thing after another, the nightmare of this suffering. And this is an example. And sometimes it's good to use extreme examples. But somehow she was this amazing, she's not a Buddhist, she just did a bit of yoga and things, but she had this extraordinary, it seems to me, emotional intelligence, you know, like this nightmare living in hell, like in a cell on her own, going completely out of her brain. She said, I realized I could choose. I realized. She said, I finally, I knew I could not change anything, but they couldn't take my mind from me. I had a choice. Oh, this is so astonishing, you know. We all, that's the courage and resilience. I mean, it's not criticizing anybody. We don't have it, but we've all got this potential to have it, that we can mold our mind into whatever shape we like. And we're not discussing, again, the brain. We're discussing the actual, internal, subjective, cognitive process itself. So listen, you people, I can chat away like this, but I want to talk to you people. I want you to ask me questions or something. I really think we make it like a dialogue, okay? <laughs> make it like a dialogue. Let's talk, please. Ask me some questions, if you'd like. I wish I could see your faces. You're all so far away, but I can't. Right, ask me some questions, people. Anything okay, like. everybody, so what we're going to do is if you've got a question, just so we you know, can see, Daniel's behind here. Just put your hand up or put your name in the chat to let us know you want to ask a question, and then we'll unmute you. Is that the way, Daniel? Bravo. And anybody in the room? Is there anybody here so far who's anybody got a Anybody question? got any questions? Anything yes, at all? Yes, we have a question, Rubina. Good, darling, Rubina, talk to we me. Have a, Good. We have a me. question. Yep. It's with Theo. Theo, okay, go big Theo. voice. Go, Theo. Hi, go. Rubina. Hi, sweetheart. So I was, I was thinking a lot about the way that we process our thoughts. I was getting a lot into cognitive behavior therapy yes. about a year ago. And yes. I realized that the more I become aware of the thought, the more I was able to um, sort of 
pick each and separate thought that coming into my mind and reprocess it and yes. think about how it's affecting me. Yes. But also I realized that eventually it drove me to a stage when I'm trying to be overly control it. Yes. Control it? No. Mm controlling of all of my thoughts in my head and i'm yes. stressing a bit about it yes right. so it's like i'm sort of getting on top of what's happening in my mind but at the same time i, I feel like i have to be constantly in control because otherwise it's all going to go to shits i understand um yeah so what's your question well my question is um maybe how to let go of control no i understand it's a really interesting point theo i mean this is it seems a bit of kind of like a contradiction in a way you know I, um, but it's not really because we do need to control the thoughts. I mean, it's really practical. Think in the most simple level when you, you know, you're, you're talking to somebody and you, and you start to feel annoyed and you're noticing you're annoyed. So then, you know, normally if we, 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 we have this idea that we follow our feelings, I mean, what, what are you going to do? You're going to vomit out your feelings and, because you, and then you're going to kind of harm somebody and harm yourself. There's no benefit in that. We've got, we've got to control our thoughts. There's no question. And we can learn to control our thoughts in the most incredibly sophisticated way. But maybe just what you, it's just, it can be, it, it's just, it's how you do it. Because being conscious of our, one of the key things, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is very interesting. Because I would say the Buddha is your best cognitive behavioral therapy. That's his exact trip. By knowing your own mind, learning to uh, learning to get this concentration, and that's very, very intensely controlling, but in the best way. Don't underestimate it. But then eventually, when it's like any skill, Theo, when you've got it, it's effortless. So, you know, in the beginning, it's going to be tough. Of course it is. When you're trying to play the piano, when you're trying to do anything, you're all over the place and you can't get it right. But it's a question of just practicing. To know your own thoughts, you absolutely have to know your own thoughts. Part of our problem, Theo, is we don't know we're angry until the word's vomiting out our mouth. We don't know we're depressed until we can't get out of bed one morning. And that's really how we live our lives. And that's insanity. And that's like the wheels falling off and then we have to go to something about it. So to be conscious of what's going on is incredible. But another approach is this one, a really excellent technique is when if you just sat down for five minutes and you allow all the uncontrolled thoughts to come and go, normally what happens is all day, whatever you're doing, you're driving the car, you're washing the dishes, you're talking to somebody, actually all the time the thoughts are never stopping, but they're sort of in the background until they start becoming violent, you know. So one of the really excellent techniques is to learn, and it's not that easy, and we'll, we'll try it, we'll do one for five minutes. You sit down you, and you decide you're going to focus, but you, you the thing is, you don't you don't force the you can't force the thoughts to go away you don't try to control them you don't try to have a dialogue with them you don't try to understand them you let them come and go like they're a room, like you're in a room full of 100 people all shouting and yelling you just decide you're going to look at a spot on the wall and let those 100 people shout and yell so the strength of your own mind to focus on that spot on the wall that will keep your mind steady you're not going to control those thoughts in your head. Those, let them come and let them go. That's a really good technique. You, you can't control them all because there's too many of them and they're all out of control. But then during your daily life, when you become more conscious, when you, you bring to bear in your daily life this skill to when you're washing the dishes and talking to your girlfriend or whoever it is, you're noticing also at the same time what's happening. And you just and we learn to develop the skill to be in control, but when it's when it's good control, it's effortless. Like if you can't drive a car properly, you struggle to get in control, but you're not good enough at it yet, you'll go crazy. But when you can drive the car well, you, your control is effortless. So you've got to just persevere with it. So, but too much control, you'll crash the car. So it's, it's just, a, it's, it's not an easy job and it's much longer than we think it does to really, really control this mind of ours. And until we're quite advanced, we can't, but we can learn to, to be in control at the same time, allow them to come and go. It's just a skill you have to learn, Theo. Are, you, are we communicating, honey? Yeah, yeah, I get you completely. I just felt like at some point I began to feel that there's certain so thoughts that I'd rather not have. And when it would come to my head, I'd be like, no. So no, you see, that's, like, see, that's, that's the them, point. No, you can't stop that, Theo. That's the point. We, and, until, we're, I mean, we, until we're highly advanced, we're going to have all this stuff. So this is, with those thoughts, you allow them to come and go. Like these crazy, I think of all my roommates in my head. You can't control every one of those roommates. They're old habits. So you let them be. You let them be. That's, you, to try and control them, you will go mad. I agree with you. You will go nuts. Do you understand my point? Let them come and go. But if you feed them, that's when they keep growing. But you let them come and go. You, it's like a kid having a tantrum. Just ignore it. Then it won't have, fa have power. So it's learning to know which thoughts to be in. Like when you've got to drive the car, you better be very conscious. But the other ones, let them come and go. So it's, you learn you have to learn this skill, you know. You're with me. Let them come and go. It's okay. What do you think? Yeah, I think it makes sense. 
But it's a tough job, Theo. This is a long-term job. I mean, this is something we don't... Really, this is not really a skill in our culture. We don't... Neuroscience doesn't teach this. This is a brilliant skill coming from these people in India. You know, they're the ones who... The, the masters at it. But to really develop control, the way they're talking, wow, honey, you've got to give up sex, drugs and rock and roll and go to the mountains to get that one. It's a full-on, pretty incredible technique. Most of us won't do that, but we can learn so much already. Thank you, Theo. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay, um, if we can have everybody come onto their video, I can see if you've got a question. Anybody here who's got a question? Yes, we have another question from here. Feel go free ahead. to put your name in the chat, but we'll start now with Michael. Michael? Go, go, go. Hello, Michael. Hi, Rubina. Hello, hi, hi, Rubina. Thanks Hello. for this today. I'd just Pleasure like going. to ask, how do you differentiate between repressing yes. your emotions yes. when dealing with a certain situation yes. and actually acknowledging no, them and letting it, them be? No, that's it, darling. This is a huge job, sweetheart. This is enormous, Michael. I mean, this is the interesting point. It seems to me in our culture, we have either, we vomit, every, certain, depends on your personality, you vomit everything out, and I'm one of those people, had really uncontrolled behavior, vomit everything out, and there's an advantage to that, but, although, but I'll talk about. Or the other one, the other extreme is deny, live in denial. And often that's, you know, that I think is um, the, the kind of approach of people who are kind of nicely behaved people, good people, kind people, who aren't volatile and angry. So one lot is to repress and, you, you know, and we all, because we all want around, we're all trying to be kind of good girls and good boys. And so it was when we're in that mode, we don't even notice what's happening until one day you can't get out of bed one morning because literally we haven't actually noticed the thoughts. We've literally repressed, you know, because we don't, we think we shouldn't be this way or whatever. The other extreme, the vomiting out, but there's a third one. And that's this approach of becoming conscious. This is not overnight, I promise. It's not overnight. And that's becoming conscious. They say, it's interesting, in the cl classical texts on this concentration meditation technique, where you're starting to focus your mind, not follow all the crazy thoughts, that one of, they say one of the signs of success at the very first stages of learning this technique is you think your mind's getting more crazy. Because you, 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 you're, you're, what, say you're, you're focusing on the breath, which is a classic technique that the Buddha taught. You focus on your breath and you allow the thoughts to come and go. You don't repress them. You don't wish they're not there. You don't have conversations with them. You don't, you know, we, we desperately wish they'd go away. You allow them to be there, like all those crazy voices in the room. You allow them to be there. So naturally we think, oh my God, my mind's getting worse. I can't believe all my anger. I can't believe my anxiety. But it's always been there. But we haven't paid attention. So it's, it's learning to not be afraid of what's in the mind and letting, allowing the thoughts to come up. But this is the crucial point. Allowing them to come up but not following them and not identifying with them. That's a major job we have to learn to do. So then they don't have so much power, but they're still there. Are you with me, Michael, or not? I am, I am with you, 100%. But this is heavy-duty stuff. I mean, the mind is such a berserk thing, you know. And with respect to us in our culture, we haven't got, I mean, we've got certain techniques, but this ability to, know, to, to, to have the confidence that we can learn to harness and work with and unpack and unravel this intensely powerful cognitive process, to really know that we can learn to be in charge of that, that's pretty powerful, you know, but we have to have courage to do it because lots of stuff's going to pop up that we don't like, you know. But to not, to allow, so also there's another point. Let's say... I'm really trying to work on my mind and I'm, I'm mad as hell at my boyfriend and I'm trying to not vomit it all out and punch him in the nose and everything, and I'm, but I'm not trying to deny it. And let's say I go to you as my friend to sort of express, you know, I'm so mad at myself, I'm so crazy, that wretched boyfriend, he did this, he did that. And the, the thing is, the reason I'm talking to you is not just to increase my anger and not for you to, to reinforce my view, to make my anger more, but I'm wanting to talk to you like, you're, like as if you're my therapist, to sort out my own mind. That's not being angry, that's working with it. That's, that's where we need good people, to, a good friend, a good therapist, where we can have a all come up and have it all come out and not be afraid of it but the ape so that's not being angry but whereas if i come to see you and i just reinforce my anger and you agree with me yeah what a creep he is yes we've been i don't know how you put up with him then that's a disaster and so i'm a, so two things i'm you've got to allow the stuff to come up it's there it's old habits but not identify with it this is intensely difficult and then then you're not repressing but you're still controlling your behavior you don't run around vomiting on everybody else we all know that's that's impossible you can't do like that we've got to behave nicely so our trouble is as soon as we behave nicely, it feels like repression. And then we feel that it's good to vomit it all out. Well, no, neither of those. It's more, this third option is learning to know we can work with what's there, learning to be in charge of what's there. I don't know. What do you think, Michael? 
that makes sense no so basically basically as you said like learning to be in charge and understanding okay why am i feeling like this and trying to deal with it in somewhat a conscious manner yeah but not even not, not even sometimes why i'm feeling i'm not even talking that is a possible that's a, one example of dealing sometimes all stuff, uh, you know, it's all stored in our mind. I mean, the Buddhist here would happen to say, and it makes sense, there's nothing we've ever said or seen or done or thought or, or looked at or heard that hasn't been stored in our mind. So our mind's full of these millions of memories and they're all kind of unedited. We know that. It's like chaos in there, you know. So what I'm saying is not always to know why am I feeling it, but allow it just to be there, but keep working on what you're doing. It's like, you know, but, but don't, we don't have to, sometimes we have to do some de good analysis. What's going on? Where's that anger come from? Why this? Why that? We have to do this. Other times, keep doing your job, keep washing your dishes and let your thoughts come and go. Oh, shut up. You know, tell yourself to shut up sometimes. It's different approaches, Michael. But the key one is not allowing it to come, but not identifying with it. It doesn't define us. It doesn't define us. But that's our tragedy. As soon as the anger starts or the depression starts, and then the stories start, and we have written a novel by the end of the day, and we want, and we want to kill ourselves again, you know? So that's the part that's so powerful. We can't help but l sort of latch onto the stories and believe the stories. But this is the crucial thing that we have to learn not to do, which is not easy. You with me, Michael? Yes, no, I'm with you. That's pretty okay. much answered what Good. I've asked. Thank you very I'm much. Glad. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I think we'll just take a moment here and go to the people online. Good. So Good. can you come Good. off video, everybody, just so I can see who might have a question? Come, come on. Yes, yes. Sophie Bartholomew, I think. Good. Go for it, Sophie. Go, Sophie. Good morning. Hello. Rabina. Hello, Good darling. morning. And yes. thank you very much for this um, okay. experience. I've heard you speak previously about compassion and how compassion is fears. And I, uh -huh. I'm trying to understand that and balance that with tolerance and acceptance with your own, my own behaviour, but then other people that yes, you exactly. love and care about. And when does the tolerance and acceptance become intolerable and unacceptable? No, I understand exactly. With exactly. compassion. I understand exactly, yeah. Well, if, you know, the, the wisdom wing and the compassion wing model is a really nice thing because the wisdom wing has to come first. That's really like compassion for yourself. They mightn't say it like that in the Buddhist approach, but it really is true. Learning to see all this stuff inside us, not to define ourselves by the unhappy stuff because join the universe, we've all got it. Know that we can learn to navigate it and work with it and lessen it and, and con you know, control in a good way. N try to identify with our, our positive qualities. That's our, That's the wisdom wing. And, and the consequence of this is you become, we become more stable, more together, more in charge of what's going on, um, more, therefore more content, and therefore less self-loathing. I mean, you know, one of our one of the tragedies is of the mind, the way the Buddhist analysis puts it, and we'll recognise when I just use ordinary words. We've got this primordial this primordial mistake we all have. This my primordial feeling we all have is this incredible dissatisfaction with who we think we are. And not, not even just that first, but dissatisfaction, one, with what I get. Ne there's always a feeling of don't have enough, not enough money, not enough, my body's not beautiful enough, this is not beautiful enough, my boyfriend doesn't love me enough. But the, the deepest level of that is this dissatisfaction with me. This is our tragedy. This is the one that's so sad. I remember the Dalai Lama hearing that and thinking it was just in the West, the pre prevalence of this, this, over, this constant dissatisfaction with who I think I am. This is the, this is the tragedy the deepest one so even so what i'm getting at is when we can start to heal that a little bit yes i am yes i've got anger and yes i'm detached and yes i'm this and yes i'm that but it's okay i'm a work in progress i'm a work in progress you know but we get paralyzed and stuck this is who i am and it's horrible so ha learning to, to work on the wisdom we work on our own mind like we're talking the consequence of that is become we become less neurotic more accepting of ourselves which is really me means more compassionate but then Obviously, when I look outside, when I'm becoming more kind to myself and understand myself, I'll realise everybody's in the same boat. In a sense, we're all cut from the same cloth. We're just different variations, you know? So I cannot possibly have compassion for others until I have compassion for myself. This is not even a, a cliche. It's profoundly true, you know? So then... When you've got work, work more in your own mind, you've got more wisdom, literally meaning you're more clear about what's going on. So whether it's, you know, so, and, so as for compassion with others and, and learning to tolerate, it's very much it depends on your, your relationship. Like if you're a mother, you, you do not tolerate. You do not tolerate. You Coming from compassion, you absolutely have to be disciplined. But if it's your girlfriend who's an equal to you, you don't run around giving them lectures, you know. So it's a question of 
um, of who your relationship is. But if it's if it's so, but it end up yeah. So in your mind, what what kind of scenario were you thinking of in where you'd learn where it's not good to be patient and tolerant? What kind of thing were you thinking of? I mean, give me an example. Is it like a political thing or tell me? I mean, it's important because they're different scenarios. You know, what were you thinking? Um, well, yeah, a, a deeply personal relationship, someone okay. I love okay. and and yet witnessing them, you know, the pattern of making poor choices and self-destructive behaviour. Okay, okay, now I get you. And okay. understanding, you know, how long do you try to okay. support them and okay, I get you. stay present no, exactly. versus... No, I totally understand. Well, this is this is really, in a, this, in a sense, is a very practical answer. You know, let's just use a simple example, like I'm an alcoholic. Let's just say that, whatever it might be, and you're my beloved friend or you're my beloved sister or something, and you can see nakedly and evidently I'm really in a bad way. It's so obvious you can see it. And of course, deep in my heart, I know I, I am too, but I can't bear to own it. You know, we all know we can't bear to. The pain is sometimes too much. You know, but you, it is completely clear to you. So this is the simple answer. This is a simple answer. If you have compassion for me, and you do, but compassion is not enough. You have to have the wisdom to know, even if I'm open to advice. I mean, you could, you probably know exactly how to help me, especially if you've been an alcoholic in the past, you know exactly the steps to take. You've got all the wisdom down, but what if I don't listen? What if I can't hear you? So that really is the main answer. If you have to be able to have the wisdom to know that what you do say to me will, will benefit me, that I'm ready to hear it. Otherwise, what's the point of bashing your head against a brick wall? So that's the point. If you say, oh, well, there's Rabina, she's being an alcoholic, but I can't help her. People almost, it almost seems like you're being, just not caring about me. But our trouble is sometimes because of our own attachment, you stick your nose in where it doesn't belong, you boss me around, you talk about me behind your back, and you call that caring. That's not caring, honey, that's your own neurosis. So we have to distinguish between genuine caring and knowing what you can do to help me. And sometimes there is zero you can do to help me because I am not ready to hear it. So keep your nose out of my business. But honey, love me, watch me like a hawk, hold on to me, talk to the better part of me, and then one day maybe I'll be listening to what you have to say. And often it's our own anxiety and neurosis that pollutes our compassion and then we think oh I'm being so compassionate trying to help Rabina but you're not you're just sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong and I'll tell you to go away and it makes a mess so that's the wisdom one sometimes we can't do much it doesn't mean you don't care it just means it won't be effective mm. do you understand darling yes thank you this is a really powerful one I tell you and that can only come from you knowing your own mind well first you can't learn this by just reading the you can't just leap in and do it because the, in other words, in our own mind, we have to distinguish between our own neediness, our own fears, our own attachment, because attachment is this junky in us and wants everything to be lovely. So attachment can only cope with lovely things, and having me be an alcoholic and vomiting in the soup doesn't make you happy at all. So don't, don't, don't make, so make the distinction between your own anxiety and attachment and annoyance with me and your compassion for me. They're very different. Mm. Do you understand? Thank you, yes. Good, Sophie. But the real one is, to, to, even though you don't say anything, it doesn't mean you don't love me. And I will know you love me. And, and the other one is this too. This is the interesting point. When I'm always, to say, talking about before how we define ourselves by our negative qualities. We define ourselves by, I am hopeless, life is worthwhile, it's not worthwhile, I'm no good, I can't do anything. Whatever the story is, and that looms large in our mind. So then equally, when we, you look at me... At looking on, you, you see how, uh, all you see is alcoholic. All you see is alcoholic. All you see is the problem. We all do to that to each other. That's like insulting a person. Talk to the better part of me. Yes, I'm an alcoholic, but you know I'm your beloved sister. You've known me for years. You know all the mm. other parts of me, and they are all there. So don't only talk to the alcoholic in me. If your sister's always depressed, don't always talk to the depressed part of your sister. Talk to her better part, and that will help. That will encourage her to hear it. But our trouble is when the other person's got a problem, we buy into the problem too and we all go we drown together you know so it's, just, it's to not buy it that is true that part of me the alcoholic one the depressed part the angry one equally i will over exaggerate it but then so will you looking on and we all do that to mm. each other but look talk to the better part of me don't always mm. look at look at me with sad eyes and poor rabina she's so alcoholic blah 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 there's many more parts to me you know i mean my own example in my life my particular tendency was to be very volatile and very angry 
So I would always vomit out whatever I felt, and there's a good side to that and a bad side. But everybody saw me as angry. I was defined in that way. So then because I was hungry to be seen as a nice girl, then we this is this kind of self-defeating, constant feedback. She's angry, then I must be angry, or you see her as angry. We don't ever see anything else. We get too stuck in our way we label each other, you know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sophie. Thank you, uh, Sophie. Uh, anybody else, just please feel free to come onto your video so I can see you. Hey? Are there any questions? Not yet. Anybody here for a question? Yes, thank you very much. This is Fran Rabina. Good, Fran. Hello, my dear. Hello, Fran. Hello, Rabina. Hello, Hello, sweetheart. Um, my question is, um, how do you move through or navigate your way through something when it seems to be demanding a lot of your emotions? such as if something happens and it demands a lot of grief from you, how do you navigate that? Are you, so say a bit more, Fran, are you meaning, for example, a, a particular dynamic with a, with a friend, with a relationship, or just something in your own mind? Give us a little bit more. Um, Without, I don't want to be too personal. I'm not trying to be like that. Yeah, so... For example, if a loved one yes. or a friend passes away, yes. and it's, it's. I understand that the mind can lead to certain large emotions such as anger and mm -hmm. jealousy, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. this is an ex seems to be such a, a grand external event which demands so much of you yes. that maybe your mind didn't lead into, and then how to deal with those emotions. Yeah. So. It I, it's, I mean, there's so many things we can say, Fran. So then, um, one, of the, one of the reasons, I think one of the ways that we suffer when something happens that's so sad, like somebody dies, or your boyfriend leaves you, some terrible, you know, or you've been together, devoted to a person for 20 years or whatever, something, or five years, and then it goes. When something ends, when things end, the, the, if we look at the way, it's, it seems very practical, but if we look at why we suffer so badly, Part of it is because we wish it hadn't happened. Would you agree with that? We yes. think it shouldn't have happened, especially if it's the death of a young person. We somehow assume it's a terrible mistake. It shouldn't happen. And then, in other words, it's resisting. It seems so easy to say it, but when things happen, sometimes we, we might all have our own analyses of why things happen. If you're a Christian, you've got one view. If you're a communist, you've got another view. I'm a Buddhist, you've got another view. I'm trying to bring it all down to earth, you know. But part of the pain is when we think it shouldn't have happened. It was a mistake that it happened. And, I mean, another whole dimension is if, if I'm part of the relationship and maybe I have guilt and those things. But somehow part of why we suffer is because we somehow feel things shouldn't happen. But that's why that woman in prison, this, this, this power, my friend Sunny, who's an old lady now, you know, she knew, she said there was, I, I, I realised I couldn't change anything. Okay, another example, at the same time I read about another guy on death row who was also innocent, and he, but he went completely out of his mind. And I'm trying to get to the same point here. He, in other words, was unable to bear the fact that this thing happened. He was accused of murder and rape. And he would sit there every day, as long as he had a voice, screaming out of his brain, I did not rape and kill that woman. So that was an immutable, absolute thing that he could not do a single thing to change it. But he didn't know he could change his mind. He didn't know he could learn to see it all differently, which sounds so simple. He, he did not know how to get past that rage and despair of this thing that happened. It shouldn't have happened. If only it hadn't happened. Why did it happen? How dare it happen? These are the voices inside us that make us go mad. So there's nothing wrong with changing something, if we can. But often, like something as, as absolute as death, there is nothing. Like my friend Sunny, she realised I could change nothing, but I could change my mind. 
So we have to even so we have to hear even what it is. We say emotion, but when I use the word mind, I'm including emotion. But if we look at our emotions, we're going to see that the beneath those emotions, they are all cognitive stories. They are all assumptions and feelings and beliefs. So we can unpa- so those are this shouldn't have happened. Why did it happen? How dare it happen? If only it hadn't happened. That's the pain we experience. You've all gone. I can't see you all. Kim, your screen has disappeared. There we go. Are you sort of hearing what I'm saying here, Fran? So this is why we have so much pain. So it's easy to say, oh, you can't change it, so let go. It sounds great. Sunny went through years of agony of working on herself, but she slowly began to realise she could not do a damn thing to change this nightmare, but she could change her mind. So in her way, she so in other words, she came to terms with this unbearable reality instead of resisting the reality. This is often a simple way to say why we suffer so badly, because we resist that reality. If you can make it better... If she could have got a key and walked out the prison, good God, good on her, you know. If you can bring that person back to life, great. But it's the resistance of it, the unbearableness of it, and we can't get past that. That's why we go mad. Do you understand what I'm saying, Fran? So work with it. Feel the grief. Feel the tears. But recognize... And the other one, I mean, it all sounds very crass to say this is one of the major points. But this is reality. We all know things happen. We We maybe can't see why things happen. But dealing 90% of our pain, if we're brave enough to navigate what does happen, if we can change it, great. But what if we can't? That's when the despair happens. That's when the craziness happens. That's when the, the, you know, the emotional pain occurs. It's not an easy thing. But this, you know, it's like, we, and we can't always work out why. But learn to, and then that's, and that's from our side. And then more and more we learn about that, and more and more empathy we can have for others and, and be happy with them and, I mean, help them, you know. I don't know, we're communicating or not, Fran? We are, thank you. Good, Tommy. And, but it's, and this is also, sweetheart, listen, we're human beings. We're all dying for love and we need friends. We might not have a therapist, might have a whatever, but to have one person whom we can turn to, one person who can help us hold our emotions, this is unbelievably beneficial, you know, to have this, to have a person we can trust and love who just can hold our pain with us. This is so important. And we can do that for others as well. This is so incredibly important. I don't know, friend. Thank you. All right, sweetheart. Keep moving, girl. Thanks. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Anybody else online who might have a question? Yes, we have a question, please. Good. Okay. Tara, okay. Is who's that? Diana. Tara no, Davy. Rosetta. Oh, Amy. Thank you very much indeed, Amy, Jason, and Ro- R- Rosetta. Good. Rosetta. Okay, Rabina, you, you may have already answered some of this, but um, when somebody admits to you that they're in that very inert and depressed stage, yes. what's the best way to support them? So they actually say to you they're depressed, you mean? You, yes. Like it's, not I'm, you, I'm it's not that you've not observed it. I'm really depressed. And, okay, okay. Yeah. You know, I think... I mean, there's a million different th- things, but somehow it feels, first of all, the fact that a person can even, especially a depressed person, can even say that is already good because that's not living in denial of it. And I mean, sometimes, okay, one of our problems, if we're coming, like I mentioned before, to, you know, to Sophie, let's, depending on who the person is, when we see that we've got our own attachment to this person and our own wish that they, you know, like... You wish they were happy and all your own neediness and your own emotional junk into it, that makes it a real problem. And then part of the problem is we, try, we think we're supposed to fix it. Or, and they start giving advice and pouring advice on top of them and talking about them behind their back. That's a nightmare. Sometimes it's just to know, just to be there, like I just said then, to be like this rock of Gibraltar for that person. Just to let, let them say what they want to say, give them a hug, let, let them know that you are there supporting, saying positive things, for example, not necessarily giving them advice, but just being really spacious and loving and kind. I mean, what else? That's a starting, that's a starting point. That's the starting point. Now, but you've got a million variations. You could have somebody who's on the phone to you for one hour every day for 25 years raving on about their depression and their anxiety. And you don't, and what am I going to do then? So it's, it's, it's like, it's how long is a piece of string, you know? But it seems to me it's at least listen, listen, listen to what they say, listen. And if they want advice, give advice. But it's like, I don't know, it's, just, it's, I ha- it's, such, a, it's such a difficult question because there's a million different variations of it. But to be empathetic, to listen. And, and, and in a way, it's like also what I said before, 
let's say in my example when I was a kid, I was angry. And it was true, I was angry. Now, I over-exaggerated my anger. I defined myself as an angry person. Then I showed that aspect to other people. And then people defined me as an angry person. So then we became stuck in that labelling. Oh, Rabina's an angry person. So this person, oh, she's a depressed person. She's, and that can then narrow everything down so tight you can't see anything else. But it's, I don't know, it's just somehow to, to, to be empathetic, to listen, to be there like a rock and that can give courage to somebody to even know there's a possibility, you know, that can be give, And then it depends on how severe the person is. Maybe that person does need a good therapist. Maybe they do need to do something about it more than merely talk to you. So there's, you've got to have such wisdom, you know, and it's not an easy answer. But at least to show empathy and not necessarily try and solve the problem and bring your own anxiety into it. Keep your own anxiety out of it, you know. I don't know, Rosetta, what do you think? No, thank you. I, that's, that's very helpful because... Um, that is the approach that I've been taking. Yes. And um, I think you're right. It's about the wisdom and you can't solve it, but just to listen. So thank I, And you. just to have that person know. I mean, we know in the world, we know whom we can trust. We know the person. If we're really desperate, we know the person we want to turn to because we know that person won't dump all over us. We know that person won't be angry with us. We know they won't give us a lecture. The person we can trust who's loving, this is a miracle to have, who really loves us for whatever ha whatever we are, then that person will know. So be that for that person. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. Thank you. All right, darling. Thanks, Rosetta. What else, people? Yes, we've got a question from Ruby. Okay, and then there's people... Okay, good. Ruby, talk to me, sweetheart. Hi, Rubina. Hello, Thanks Ruby. for coming back to us. Oh, it's total good to pleasure. see you. Yes. Um, my question to you is... Um, how how can we gain closure from people or situations that have caused us great trauma when we can't necessarily get it from them, whether they've passed away or I just you, know sweetheart. a, a I parent who yes. you just know they're never going to be the person that you that yes. you're attached to? Then exactly. How that. do you navigate that? That's I know, sweetheart. That's. I mean, I think maybe last time I was there, I don't know, I used the example of my own relationship with my father, you know, who was quite abusive to his daughters. I don't need to go into details. But somehow then he passed away, you know. He died when, when I was about 30. Less than that, 25. Um, it has, this is where I think sometimes in our culture, we really feel it has, your problem is, we think the problem is with the relationship, so you have to solve it together. So that means we often feel, unless we go to the other person and get them to admit what they did wrong and get them to apologize and own it, we really do feel that we can't do anything. This is, I think, the worst tragedy. That just ends up becoming anger and rage. Because the, the reality is, my father's dead, you know. I have to work on my own mind. And that means, that okay, it's not that easy, but I can certainly say I've done that. I absolutely love my father now. I can see his own suffering. I can see what he did was because he was suffering. It doesn't mean he was right in what he did. It was completely wrong what he did. But I have so I, 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 I identify with his qualities. I can see his good qualities. And that's what I said before. Don't just define the person in one thing. You know, we do that when, like, a person is a pedophile. We only see a pedophile. We see nothing else but pedophile. And please hear my, I'm using extreme example on purpose, you know. We own, and if we panic, my God, this is evil. He's a pedophile. I can see that working with people in prison. I mean, I know people who've, who've, who've harmed children in prison. I know people who've murdered, who've raped. But I, because I don't, I don't ask them what they do. So I see the whole person. This, I think, is fundamentally necessary as part of our own healing of our own pain. So the, what I'm getting at is, in one way, I had to learn to stop identifying my father in terms of the bad things that he did. I, I was able, even as a good little girl, I always saw his other qualities. I always saw his goodness, which is very fortunate. You know, I saw his other qualities. That's an incredibly powerful thing to do. And then he did have, I mean, he was remorseful. He, that, was, that was incidental, I think. But in the end, I, I had to see him as the whole person and know he, you know, and then in my own mind, learn to, learn to, it, is, it comes from anger. I mean, it might sound very shocking, but it's anger. It's resentful. He, you know, I can only feel better if he apologises. This might, we, we will go mad. This might not ever happen. We have to learn to heal it in ourselves and learn to let go of it. And that's not easy. Oh my God, it's not easy, sweetheart. But this, for our own sanity, because if the person's dead or if he's never going to acknowledge, when we, we are going to go mad if we are waiting for this person to admit his part. And then sometimes even what happens, because part of our own suffering is coming from anger in a way, although it sounds kind of cruel to say that, 
but it is. Like, how dare he do that? And, you know, even if he does apologise, it still doesn't mean we're going to feel any better until we've done something inside our own selves and learned to um, just heal. And you know, there are a million methods for doing this. It's not that easy. But learning to heal... I mean, that mean, and that and that shockingly means having compassion. I'm able now very easily to have compassion for my father because I know, I know that the only person who harms another is a person who's neurotic themselves. This is not it's so easy to say this. So if I've got enough courage in my own mind to see my own neuroses, and if I also have enough courage to own my rubbish, okay, I'm not a pedophile, but if I can own the stuff I have done to harm other people. In other words, we're all in the same boat, not to have this sense of these evil people out there. We are all in the same boat. We've all got depression and anxiety and anger. We all say things to harm others. We all do things to harm others. Maybe don't all jump on little girls, but we all do something. And if I can have that sense of connectedness with that rest of that, rest of that other part of my father, then I can learn to let go of it and learn to stop the anger and stop the pain and heal myself because my father's dead. I don't know. I'm just saying a few words, Fran. I don't know if this is helpful sweetheart it takes courage it, it, it takes enormous courage you know it def yeah i i totally agree um because I, I find there's multiple people who i find that i need to forgive and i'm giving my too much of my own energy i'm bringing myself down okay that, um, yeah. trying yeah go on trying trying to heal from those situations and so for instance for from an abusive ex-partner yes. who i've cut out he's not dead so i could really find him and you know track him down yes. and make him apologize yes. but i don't want to do that i don't want to invite that back into my life no that's right i just want to let that's another important point fran i think the forgiveness one don't let it come My too quickly Fran. don't let it come too quickly don't just leap in and forgive you've got to work on your own stuff first and your own pain and your own hurt the forgiveness will come later when you have healed yourself then it's when i can understand myself and work through all this then it was easy to have love and compassion for my father but don't do that too soon don't leap into that because that is not it's too soon you know you've got to work on yourself first compassion and forgiveness can come later that's later when you've got more healed in yourself. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Definitely, definitely. That's really I think important. my struggle is as well is just putting a time limit on these things because even though it has been years, I still so it's been it's been like 5 6 years. So plus. what what are, what are you still um, feeling? What what would you say you're still feeling? Sorry? What do you say? What would you say it is that you're still feeling after 5 years? How would you articulate? Anger. Anger, anger. because it was harmful. So much anger. Okay, darling. Sorry? Okay. So, okay, so let me ask you a question. This is where I think we've got to really look at the wisdom wing side. You weren't a little girl when you had this relationship, right? You were, you were a grown-up. I mean, relative, you're, you're a grown-up right now, are you? I presume you're I a grown-up. I was 19. Okay, 19. Well, you're not five years old, right? No. You with? No. Okay, good. Okay, so one of the powerful things we have to do is that you went into this relationship. You kind of... You, he didn't kind of force you and lock you in the bed and rape you every day. I'm not being sarcastic here. Try and get my point. You had this relationship and then he became abusive. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So, sweetheart, one part that I think is missing in all of us is, yes, he did those things. And I'm not arguing with you. But what we, the real learning, and this is when we, only when we really can do this, Fran, this is when we can stop the anger. When you start to learn about your mind and your, and what, and your own fears and your, whatever it was that was playing out in you in that relationship that didn't enable you to say, mate, I'm out of here. Do you know about that part of yourself? That's not blaming the victim. It's learning to grow up and become powerful and strong because you clearly are intelligent. You've got a good mind. So what is it in you? That's the real learning. And when you can do that, Fran, what he did to you will be water off a duck's back. Because anger is part of the process of feeling impotent. So what can you learn about your mind over that process of that relationship? What is it that you, if, you, know, you learn about yourself that allowed you to play into this part? That's how, I think this is the part we have to learn to do. Then we become strong and powerful when you can own your own stuff. Are you so with me at all or not? Can you, uh, go on. Sorry. Go, no. I, so I've done I've done a lot of work on this, and I've, I've yes. acknowledged, and I have a lot of compassion for myself of where I was at in in that yes, time in my exactly, life, and exactly. why I allowed things to go on so long. Yes. And I understand. I also understand the background that he has come from, yep. and the traumas that he's gone through his life, and why he is the way he is. But I'm still just finding it really hard no, to you. excuse the behavior. I do hear you, darling. So okay. Yeah. So what do I, you? I guess I guess it's just more work. <laughs> so what do you feel? Like, okay. Um, 
again, back to that point I said before then, is that, can you, are you able, are you able to see him, I don't know, I mean, there's so many things, Fran, you, it seems to me you're doing well, you just got to keep going, so, okay, but maybe let me ask you a question, how would you speak what anger is saying, what is, what is, you said you feel anger, you're very clear, what is that saying, what is anger saying? What is it's anger? It's just How a lot of yelling it? and it's quite violent. I'd say it's more of a physical anger. <laughs> yours. I'm talking about yours. I'm talking about Sorry, your anger. No, I'm not talking about his anger. I'm talking about you said you still feel anger, right? No, me, me towards him, I want to physically hurt him. Oh, okay. That's what you're saying. The anger that's is... So you're still as, okay, you're still as mad as hell at him. I can hear that. Okay, good. <laughs> I know. I understand, <laughs> darling. So and you, you just, you're mad at him. So then... But... Okay. I mean, were you there when I take that? I don't. In? I don't. The thing is, I don't want to have this anger. I don't want to hold. No, I, hear you. I don't want to. I don't want to be. I don't want to hurt anyone physically. No. But these are these thoughts that keep on coming up every time I think about him. Right. And I try to move on from him. Yep. To, you know? I understand. I hear you, darling. So. So anger is. How dare he do that? Isn't it? That's what it's saying. How dare he be that way? Right? Is that right? Correct. That's anger, yeah. isn't it? Would you agree with that, darling? Yes. Are you still there with me? I can't see you so well. It's a trouble. Yeah. I can't see your face. Good. So then, but I, I still so. think you have to do more about seeing you at that time and what and how you would like to have been. Because my sense is, I don't know, you know, Fran, I don't know when I was there last. Were you there when I talked about how my that, that scenario in which I got raped? Were you there when I talked about that? I was, yeah. Do you remember the, the discussion for me? That's what I, I learned. I was 23, 22, 24. And I remember learn that was it just happened. My nature is very volatile, and I learned to, to manage that whole scenario and dominate these two men, and I ended up becoming coming out of it. The, the, what I'm getting at here is this: when a person has been abused, harmed, raped, whatever it might be, some kind of you know, which is what you're mad at him and his behaviour, whatever it was that he did. When we are, and I'm, I have to watch my words here because don't, don't misunderstand me, when we are unable to handle what the other person is bringing to us, but for whatever reason, when I was able to handle that scenario and I came out powerful, then I had no anger. I laugh at those guys. So what I'm getting at, Fran, when we all are victimised by other people, this is the nature of the human race. And then so... When you can start feeling strong and brave and realize that you didn't have where you were at then, not blaming you, never to blame, but learn about how you would like to have been. Imagine how you would like to have been then and then try to aspire to become like that and feel powerful and then learn from that. And that was your part. It's like a tennis match. You were in a tennis match with this guy and he was smashing balls at you and you're, and you're demanding that he pay a better tennis game. Maybe the thing is what we have to look at is how can I improve my tennis? What could I have done better? Not out of guilt, Fran, but out of a learning. So next time in next relationships, you are more powerful and less victim. I don't know. Are we communicating at all? Definitely, yeah. It's a, it look to me. It sounds like I'm on a, the correct path. You are, darling. You're doing well. Kind of just have. It's it's good to kind of know that I'm doing the. You right are doing work. well. Keep looking at your mind. It's just a long process. It is, and I gotta be patient. It is a long process, and that's part of it's part of the deal. That's just it is. But the the real one is learning not about him, but about your mind, honey. Learn about you. Learn about your mind. Let him learn about his mind. That's his problem. Yeah, I think that's important to keep the focus on myself. Yes, and darling, I'm the absolutely. One, I'm to absolutely. Kill me instead of trying to put the focus on Ex other people. Absolutely, absolutely. This is the point, you know. Absolutely, that's it, friends. So keep moving, girl. Thank you so much. Thank Rabina. you, sweetheart. Hi, Tara. You had a question. Yes, I did. Thank you. Good. Hi, Robina. Hello, sweetheart. So. I'm going to go back to talking about how it's really beneficial to have someone to talk to, to yes. let all this go. I use journaling because yes. um, I don't have that. And so this has been kind of an open question in this dichotomy of like, so I don't have that. You don't have any friends is what you're saying. I don't have a friend. You have no friends on the planet. I, I, it's like, I'm not, it's like there, I could get depressed about not having a friend, but it's like that, that's just seeing myself lacking and not, um, and not just going and seeing what my, I'm sorry, my words are failing. Um, 
it's like that's that's seeing myself as not having what I need seeing that's that's being attached to having a friend Uh to get my need as opposed to um as opposed to seeing myself already whole Uh um so where's the problem recent a recent insight has been that I think I'm lumping a majority of people into the classification of enemy basically even though it's you know it's subtle but it's still that's where they're that's the bucket they're ending up in so you feel um, separate from people you're feeling kind of people are all I out. definitely okay. definitely yeah okay so what how go on so go on so I'm so <laughs> it's where's the problem uh, maybe it's my own protection of uh-huh. just keeping keeping myself separate I definitely you know I don't want to be hurt uh-huh. um um, so I definitely feel like a barrier of even just making friends, um, and those well, are the you, other causes for that, yeah. for sure. Are um, you feeling the lack of friends though? Are you feeling the lonely? You're talking about being lonely, is that what you're saying? And you feel afraid of being friends? You feel like, because you see them as, you've got aversion to people and you're protecting yourself, you're saying, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm definitely saying that. Yeah. Um, the loneliness isn't as much because I'm like working a little bit more inter- more internally and like, yes. well, what am I waiting for? Sure, exactly. Um, but at the same time, it's still an open question of like, well, how do I go about making friends? How do I go about trusting? Okay, so uh, this is again the wisdom wing and the compassion wing, Tara. You've got to do the wisdom wing first. Maybe it's time for you to be internalized, not to be self-centered, but to really learn to work on your mind. So I'm saying to Fran, I'm saying to all of us, we've got to work, you know, if, if we're so hungry to have friends, there's something, it's sort of like being hungry for drugs or hungry for food. It's because there's something missing. Yeah. Well, you'll never find it as long as you live, sweetheart. You've got to do the, the work right. on, we've got to do the inner work first. It sounds so easy to say that. We've got to do both, have both wings. But you, you, no matter if you are still, you know, you've got to keep working on your own mind. You have methods, you have techniques. You're trying to do that. You've got to practice every day. Or what? No, well, my practice Any kind hasn't of been as solid though. Well, you um, know, I mean, this is then, and then when you so. heal, when you put yourself together, then you know, friends won't be a problem. Friends, friends will come running. You'll be people will love to be around you, you know. So we've got to do our own inner stuff first. It all sounds so corny. I don't mean it to be this way. And we can't have this hunger for friends or feel lonely. And then you pushing. You said you you put them all in the aversion bucket. Well, that's a problem, you know. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Totally. Yeah. So just keep working at it, honey. I mean, what else can I say, you know? And, uh-huh. and it all, it's all sounds you. so corny when we say it in, in our, they don't say it like this in Buddhism, like be your own friend and learn to love yourself first. But it's, it's, it's implied, you know. And this is where we can, if we understand this Buddhist analysis of this intense dissatisfaction we have, this is a disease of attachment. We never feel we are enough. We never feel we have enough. We're like bottomless pits. And this is also what's interesting, Tara. I mean, you know, we can talk about attachment to drugs, sex, rock and roll, it's kind of the obvious things, this hunger for things, this hunger for something that we feel we're missing. But the deepest attachment we have, which is why we have so much pain, <laughs> is this hunger to be approved of by others, this hunger mm. to be seen and heard. So we have the, it is marvelous to have friends. It is good to have people who love us and adore us and praise us and help us. But if we have this constant, the deepest hunger in us is to be seen and heard and approved of. And, and often that is where we go mad because we're too we're too scared to be authentic. We're too scared to do what we feel we should do because we're afraid of what people think. And this is pretty primordially deep inside us. We don't even notice it, you know. I mean, they talk about the yogis up in the mountains who've given up sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but they're still thinking about what the people in the village are thinking about them. This is pretty primordial in us. This is the one that causes so much of our pain, you know. And it's this conversation yeah. in our head all the time. So, to, And I remember one time, I remember he, reading about one Australian nurse who worked in England with the dying. And she wrote a book, The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. And she said, the greatest regret was that I didn't follow what I knew I really wanted to do. I did what I thought was expected of me. This is what I'm talking about. This takes time. This takes. This is part of the whole process of growing up, you know, of becoming who we really are, having this real courage to know 
what is the thing I need to do and want to do and to have the courage to do it no matter what people think. Not in a self-centered way, not in a selfish way, but it's the courage to it's the courage to do this. And so that's the part, the inner part we have to do, Tara, rushing, you know, and then, then the rest will come. I promise the rest will yeah. come. So it's cliched, but we need to learn to really approve of ourselves first. This is such easy words, but it's a pretty deep job to do, you know. Keep moving is all I can say. Good. Right, I Good. Yes. Yeah. Who else? Good. Go. Daniel, is anybody else wants to talk to me? Yeah, Alex, you've got your hand raised there, mate. Did you have a question? Can you please unmute yourself? And yes, I do. Thank you. Good, Alex. Sorry about my um, video. Is uh, I'm having some okay. technical. Yeah, sorry about okay, that. Okay, no worries. Go Thank on. you, Lena, for the talk. It's been amazing so Good. far. Good. I, uh, my question relates to one of the previous speakers who spoke about um, your, your advice was to um, work on ourselves in relation to forgiveness for something that they'd uh, done yeah. for us. Yeah. And just to kind of clarify, it feels like what you're saying is that it's a case-by-case situation depending on what it is that you need to work through so when you talk about working through something what are we are, are we are, are we specifically going through um whatever that problem was whatever that person mm -hmm. did to us or didn't do to us right. or what we needed from them and then is it about giving that to ourselves like what is the i know technique? i hear you it's really i know i do hear you alex it, it is so it's sometimes so specific. I mean, I could, you know, if I just use the example of myself, like I said about my father, mis you know, behaving wrongly towards his daughters, including me, just using my example. And even in that case, each of our sisters, we were different in the way we responded to it and what we, how we worked with it. I don't know what to say. It's, it's very interesting. It's like, you know, I think, like, you know, Fran was saying, We've got, she's got this anger. We have to, are you talking about having anger? I'm going to be specific now without trying to be personal. Are you talking about a particular relationship where someone's abused or harmed you and you're full of anger, you're full of resentment? What is it? Say, say specifically the feelings you're having without trying to be yeah, too personal. Yeah, yeah yes, it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing about resentment, yeah. You're mad at somebody for harming you. Is that what it is? Correct. Okay. I mean, this is, I know it's, it's God, I mean, join the human race. Nobody in this planet has a person who hasn't harmed them, right? So it depends on the degree, isn't it? So, so much of that process, I can, okay, do you have, okay, do you, do you see anything good in this person or you only see the bad? No, no, I, I absolutely do. It's, you do? it's, um, I think what you said before about what, it, what kind of person I needed to be. Yeah. Well, learning from your own, learning from your part. Yeah. 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 Okay. Get, learning from your, your part in the relationship. You mean, is that what you're saying? That's what yeah, I'm I mean, so when I guess back, you know, because it happened, like, I guess I'm referring to myself when I was younger and okay. I, I probably didn't have the, the wisdom, the no, that's right. to be able to deal with what was going on. Exactly, so, exactly. So, how do I, so I, what, what, what would your suggestion be in order to. Well, you know, it's like of, whatever, if everything, whatever's going, whatever happens to every second of our life, our mind is doing something. So, whether we're a little boy or a grown up, if someone's mean to you, depending on your personality, you're going to respond a certain way. So if you're like a good boy and you don't get angry, you'll be passive, you'll be afraid, maybe then you know you will allow the person to do what they do. And so then when we think about it later, then we get angry with us. I think it's anger with ourselves. This is to Fran as well. I think when things happen where people abuse us and, and it's like we are angry with ourselves for allowing it to happen. We rage on. If only I'd done this and if only I'd done that and if only I'd done this. Are you seeing what I'm saying, Alex? That's our own impotence and that's our own anger and anger is the response when this attachment doesn't get what it wants so when we can if we can feel powerful in an environment like people powerful in in something then we don't have any suffering you know it's because we don't feel powerful so it's learning to i mean there's so many ways to look at it but i know 
each person is very different as well. But I know in my process, or let's say with my father, even this has just happened to be my personality, even as a little girl, I knew somehow he suffered. That helped me enormously. So that's, that's part of the empathy in me, that even though he was wrong in what he did, then it was easier for me to let go of it because I realised he was suffering. Now, I don't know if you can... Can you see that in this person? Can you see that that person must have been suffering? And I'm not saying you should see that because maybe it's not too soon to see that. But can you see that in this person or not? Uh, yeah, 100%. 100%. I think, I think what frustrates me is that there's a... Um, the, the lack of awareness and in the, the other person self-righteousness of the other person okay okay just... okay okay good now we're getting somewhere this is good so you're still pissed off at them because because they don't they don't they're not changing and they're not taking responsibility is that what you're saying correct yeah yeah that's right that's the difference so that part that's where that's what the part you have to accept you can't change that. That's the bit about not changing. And this is where still, in other words, okay, now I think this is the point, the same with Fran. What's inside when we are wanting the other person to acknowledge us? This is the hunger in us that's very deep. We have this deep hunger. You want this person to be conscious. You want this person to acknowledge what they've done wrong. And you want this person to change. And I think it's, that perhaps that's, this is the one I'm talking about. We all are craving for the other person because until we feel that unless they find, lay own their mistake we feel we can't let go of it is that what you're sort of saying yeah there's there's such an element of that for sure. yeah okay that's the part you've got to let go of this person is who they are this person fran maybe and her dude he is who he is so what we have to let go of is the expectation that they change that's what anger is and attachment attachment wants what we want that will not happen alex that will not happen. Don't have any expectation this person is going to own any responsibility, become conscious, change, or beg forgiveness. And as long as we want that, that's the one of wanting approval. That's our deepest suffering. We want the other person to change so that we can feel better. That will not happen. That's what we have to learn to let go of. We have to change. Let them be. Let him be who he is. Let him be. We have to change and give up wanting him to be the way we want him to be. That's what rage is and that's what anger is and that's what hopelessness is. Yes, yes, it's, 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 this is what I've done cognitive, like okay. intellectually Great. I understand. Keep moving, then. honey, just keep doing it. And, you know, keep doing it, keep doing it. And then you're able, and then when you are really, in other words, this attachment for other, we have this constant craving for other people to be the way we want them to be before we can change. Look at most relationships. It's like this terrible negotiating. I'll change if you change. I'll forgive you if you... It's like schizophrenic, you know. We have to yeah. do the work ourselves and let the other people be. Fran, when the you same. Say, when you say change, this is the thing. When you say change, is it? This is, this is kind of what I'm getting at as well. Like, what is it? What do I need to do? To stop do wanting that? him to cha stop wanting him to be different. Stop wanting him to be the way he can't be. Stop expecting. That's what attachment is. This energy is attachment. This hunger that things have to be the way we want. He will stop expecting him to change. So am slowly, I giving slowly. myself that because I'm uh, because the upsetness is because I didn't get something. So do I give that to myself? Is no, that, I see what, what you're is? saying. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's not so much like that. What do you mean you're you? You didn't get something. You mean this person didn't behave? Like I wanted, I, I wanted, you know, I wanted something that I felt was lacking in the relationship. Yeah, because so. it's, but, but no, 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 don't give it. No, no. Well, yes, you can say it like that, but it's not. It's not quite like that. I don't think. Like you know, my father didn't behave the way he should have. Fran's boyfriend didn't behave the way he should have. Or put it this way: why we suffer is because. He didn't, they, these people, your person too, didn't behave in the way that we expected them to, that we wanted them to. So the more hungry we are for that person to be different, the more hungry Fran is for this dude to be different, the more hungry you are for this person to be different, then the more you suffer. So you, not giving it to yourself so much, you could say that would be the consequence. If you learn to heal your own mind, it sounds so easy to say these things, but li getting, giving up expecting him to be different, that's what's gonna heal you. When you finally accept 
This is who he is. That's my friend Sunny in prison. She ranted and raved and this is wrong. I should not be here. And then she said, finally, I realized I could not change anything. You've got to think that, Alex. Then she started to realize she could change her mind and, and decide to think the way she wanted and to accept that this is the reality. This is who he is it and is this is what he's like. That's the healing sense. process. That's the yeah, healing process. The, when she began to change that's when she realized she could change she said i knew i had a choice to right, change so, her and thoughts what is that? and the choice is to what to think Act differently to she did yoga every day she worked on her mind she read certain things she decided this is really this you know even as, as not a nightmare is like that she decided to see the good things that were there the opportunities and she became a brave wonderful whole compassionate person by the time she got out 17 years later and she was carrying no junk Okay, great. So you're, you yeah. know, we have this deepest hunger in us that the person should be another way. And then the resentment and the bitterness after you realise he did all the, you know, that he's got to own it and change. Don't expect that. Give that up. <laughs> They're accepting. I mean, it sounds so easy. It's the hardest job we'll ever do. This is how it is, reality. And then you stop expecting him to be different. You've got yeah. to cut the cord, you know, slowly accepting who you are and being content with it and letting go of it and see it as, that's what I said to Fran, try and learn about your mind. It's like a learning. If you go skiing and you break your leg, you can curse and swear and blame the ski maker. You can also learn about your mistakes. Even if you're five years old, you can learn about your mistakes. What should, what could have I been? Not out of guilt and anger and beating yourself, but... You know, so then now I'm going to become this way. I'm going to become more brave in my relationships. I'm going to not allow this kind of thing to happen. You learn from it now, and you then will get the benefit of that and become a more brave, wise Alex. I think exactly. This is. I think that's what I was driving at. Yeah, Rebecca, good. Was that I'm. I'm. I can. I. Uh, I can start acting the way you that want. Yeah. I wanted to act. That's back right. Then. Exactly. Yes. That exactly. Now. Exactly. That's exactly right, Alex. And that's yeah, why yeah. that experience I mentioned, I don't know if you were there then, doesn't matter, about when the so-called rape, you know, when I somehow became in charge of it. In the end, because I was the boss and I did not, I, I became the boss. They ended up being the victims. I became the boss. I had zero suffering. I did not suffer. So that's when I realised we do not suffer yeah. when, we have, when we don't have fear. For whatever reason, I was able to be the dominant. Whatever reason, it was a, it's a very powerful experience for me. I didn't become victimized. I'm not trying to blame victims. When we can, you Thank know, you have so our much. own power to do what we want and how be the way we are, and have the courage to not, and the, yeah, the courage to do what we want to do and be the way we want to be. That's what freedom is. It's to have this freedom to be like that. Learn from that, and then this person will dis disintegrate in your mind, and you'll just have compassion for this poor, sad, pathetic person, Alex. <laughs> Thank, thank That'll you. come eventually, I promise. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Good, darling. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Sandra, you had a question as well? Uh, yeah. I'm back to the dying person who said I did what I thought was expected of me. Yes. Um, I, I'm in Canada, and, and there's a lot of that here. So <laughs> I don't want to do what's expected to me. So of me so I, I can't change these people who continually quietly want me to do something they expect me to do and i don't want to live with regret later that i that's right it. exactly so, so what I, you, I have know what you, you have to know what you want sandra you have to know what you want sandra you have to know what you want sandra what do you want when you know what you want then that gives us the courage to move and do it is that and then and then then those people then you have the power to tell those people it doesn't matter about those people they're not i'm not discussing those people at all i couldn't care about those people i'm talking about you when we know what we want of course i mean you've got to know what you want you might want to kill your father don't do that please you've got to know what it is you really feel you want and not be restricted by what you think other people want of you don't have to tell them they're not i'm not interested about them you have to know what you want and you'll follow that and, and you'll follow that and do that have the courage to do that no matter what people think of you have the courage okay, to thanks. do what you want. Do you know what you want? Okay, thanks. Do you know what you want? I'm trying to Good know girl. It, okay, keep moving. The, right keep moving, honey. The middle Have the that. courage to say it. We mightn't be able to do it, but often what we... You know, even if it's just go away for a weekend, we, you know, we've got to know we want it. 
but maybe you won't be able to do it, but you've got to know I want this, and then you slowly move towards it. Not all the time worry about other people, what they think. That's what we spend our lives doing, and we don't even realize it. It's very powerful. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Be brave. Keep moving. What else, people? Daniel, is somebody else? Now, Maria, do you have time to do your question? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Can I, you see me? I can see and hear you, Maria. Thank you so much and welcome, Rabina. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, my question is, you know, I'll be very blunt. After a lifetime, up until about, say, 10, 15 years ago, um, my life was always, um, the foundation was abuse from others, um, self-doubt, um, fear, trying to navigate a way of finding myself and empowering myself and, and to be courageous, which led me into the world of entertainment. And I thought if I, if I could control that and, and gain some success, then I would have control over all the abuse that was occurring in my life. So cut to the chase. I got rid of all that abuse. Um, I found myself a loving partner. I guess I'm fairly successful, but I have a voice, an innate deep voice in my soul um, that is the saboteur, that every time um, I'm given fantastic opportunities, whether it be personal or career-wise, there is a voice that tries to undermine everything I've achieved and basically pushes me uh, into a corner of failure, of self-doubt, of no love for myself, basically. Okay, So, so just, the question is, yeah. how do I get rid of that devil Darling, on my I shoulder? Know, I mean, but Maria, you know, I think 99% of the work you're doing is that you already hear it. Most of us don't even hear it and don't even know that's the problem and just say they're paralyzed or blame everything else. It's just a bit, when you understand something's a very old habit, and so clearly it's a very old habit. Never mind how old the habit is and don't worry where it came from, but it's just the default mode that your mind runs to, but you notice it. So it's not, again, like I said at the very beginning, it's not set in stone. It is an old habit, but we all know the nature of habits is that they can change. So instead of having a panic attack every time you hear it, instead of exaggerating it, giving it more power than it's got, you simply hear it and then you simply argue with it. Well, it's not true. The irony of ego is that we believe the crazy stories. Bad enough we think these dumb stories about ourselves, but the tragedy is we believe they're true. So you can, you've can you already proved yourself they're not true. So you, it's like an old residual habit. So don't give it more power than it's got, but simply argue with it. It's like, and, and habits die hard, but they do die. So just keep moving, Maria. Don't make it worse than it is. Don't think it's worth. Don't don't give it more power than it's got. But don't make it go away and don't be scared of it either. Listen to it, hear it, counteract it, and just keep moving. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. Thank you. Honestly, thank you very much. That's it, darling. Tibetans have a lovely way of saying practice makes perfect. It's a more humble way. They say nothing gets more difficult with practice. <laughs> So true. I know. So, honey, really, <laughs> don't make it worse than it is. I think, you know, it is still there, but it's okay. It's a crazy roommate. It's a funny, ridiculous roommate, but don't give it more power. Just be friends with it. Thank you. Tell it to shut up sometimes, argue with it, and slowly <laughs> the new roommates will take place. Don't you? Truly, Maria. I really think so. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, darling. Appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you Rabina. Thank you, Maria. What else, people? Anybody? Everybody? What else, people? We've got five minutes left, oh, Rabina. Oh, have we? Well, I wanted oh, I to... Thought... Where's Brenda? Is Brenda there? That's Natalie's mummy, right? Are you there, darling? Here is Brenda. Absolutely. Brenda, sweetheart, Brenda? did you mind... You, would you mind if I just led a little tiny meditation? Should we just... Can we just lead a little meditation for Natalie? Should we do that? Would you like me to do that, Brenda? And Robert is here as well. All right, Natalie's good. Natalie's there. Okay. That'd be lovely. Put your mic up a bit closer, Brenda. I can't hear you, darling. Oh, yeah, that'd be lovely. Would Thank you like you. to do that? How are you coping with everything? Are you ma are you handling things? Are you managing it? 
I'm, I'm allowing myself to feel it oh, good. at the I, moment. I can't even yeah. imagine it. I can't even imagine the pain of a mother and a father. I truly, I cannot even imagine it, Natalie, I'm Brenda. I really can't. So, darling girl, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I want to. I just, I want to just lead a little meditation. It's, um, it's just, it's just kind of visualize. We talk about the medicine Buddha. I'm not I'm trying to make you religious or anything, but it's just this energy of healing, energy of um, positive, and we call it the medicine Buddha. And I just want to have a little visualize. Can we, would you mind if we did this, Brenda? A little visualization to finish. Would you like me to do that? Yep, go right ahead. Okay, so we just do, <laughs> treat it as something like, it's not holy, don't think it's holy, you people. We just do it very naturally. So we can imagine, just imagine in the sky, this kind of blissful, clear, I mean, if you know about medicine, Buddha, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It's just this healing energy, blue, it's blue light. So visualize this blue light and imagine coming from this blue light, imagine Natalie and everybody else we want to have, give, give good thoughts for our own selves, the whole universe of suffering people, but you visualize Natalie there and this blue light is pouring in, pouring into Natalie, blessing her precious little mind whatever she is now, whatever you feel about these things, and all the suffering people you can think of and all the suffering people in this universe lost in their own pain, not realizing their own pain, not knowing what to do with it, and not having the confidence that we've all got this amazing potential, this confidence to know that we are worthwhile. So this blue light, imagine filling us completely, making us know that we are worthwhile, know that we have amazing qualities. I'm just visualizing that and I'm just going to sing a few times this little mantra it's the mantra of the of the medicine Buddha and imagine the sound of it again going out and raining down on everybody blessing all of us with courage and optimism I'm just visualizing just a couple of minutes you know Taya taum bekanze bekanze maha bekanze bekanze ranza samungate svaha Taya taum bekanze bekanze maha bekanze bekanze ranza samungate svaha Taya taum bekanze bekanze maha bekanze bekanze ranza samungate svaha Taya taum bekanze bekanze maha bekanze bekanze Ranza samungate svaha Taya taum bekanze bekanze maha bekanze bekanze Ranza samungate svaha Taya taum bekanze bekanze maha bekanze bekanze Ranza samungate svaha So imagine all of us completely full of this radiant healing blue light. Every one of us in the universe, naturally every single being, all of us filling us with this courage to see what's going on in our minds. And then when we see this, we know how to help others and to never give up, never give up, never give up is the main one, never give up. Full of this courage, full of this goodness, full of this healing. Thank you, Rebecca. Oh, sweetheart. That's it's, it, Brenda. It's hard to put into words how I feel right now, but I do feel the support of, of everybody in the room and from you over the over the distance, over Good, the waves. Good, darling. Um, and I think a really important lesson, lesson here, which you've already yes. mentioned, is um, yeah. finding good friends yes. to share. Yes. Um, issues with and, yes. and hear their compassion yes. and just to know that people do understand That's where it, you darling. are exactly. and what you're going through yes. um they can't fix it they can't yes. change they can't undo what's happened yes. but um sharing definitely yes. is yes. and understanding that people are there for you yes. and reaching out is really important thank you that's it brenda thank you precious one thank you everybody so so much okay thank you so much thank, kim for inviting thank you. me Thank you very much, Rubina. Thank okay. you to everybody who's yes. been with us, yes. to Natalie's parents, yes. to you all, and we will see you next Thursday yes. at the same time. And never give up. Thank people. you so much. Never give up, never give up, never give up, okay? Everybody. Much love. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.